Okay, Fesca Mahaludin, good afternoon everyone and welcome to the Justice Subcommittee on Policing. It's our sixth meeting of 2019. We have apologies from the uh, Deputy Convener, Margaret Mitchell. Our first item of business today is to consider whether to take Agenda Item 3, which is consideration of the evidence heard uh, in private. I think the reality is that time will preclude us doing that, but are we agreed if required? Agreed. Thank you. Agenda item two, uh, our main business is today is an evidence session on the Scottish Government's response to the subcommittee's recent report on Police Scotland's proposed use of digital device triage systems, otherwise known as cyber kiosks. As members will recall, we published our report on the 8th of April this year, setting out our views on the proposed use of cyber kiosks by Police Scotland. This was based on the written and oral evidence we received during our inquiry. And I refer members to Paper 1, which is a note by the clerk, and Paper 2, which is a private briefing. And I welcome our panel of witnesses today, Hamza Yusuf, Cabinet Secretary for Justice, Ewan Dick, Interim Deputy Director, Police Division, and Juliet Harkins, Director of Legal Services at the Scottish Government. Um, and before we move to questions, I'd like to invite the Cabinet Secretary to make some brief opening remarks. Uh, thank you, Convener. It will be uh, very brief. Uh, I'd like to begin uh, my remarks, first of all, for thank by thanking the subcommittee uh, for the time that they've taken to consider this important issue. Uh, as I noted in my letter to the subcommittee uh, to yesterday, uh, this is, of course, a complex and rapidly evolving area. Uh, while it is obviously for Police Scotland to ensure that they exercise their powers in accordance with the law uh, as they move towards implementation of the new devices, both they and uh, SPA bodies agreed with the subcommittee that additional clarity in the future legal framework uh, may be required to ensure Scottish criminal justice can keep pace with technological change. I believe the subcommittee uh, shares my commitment to the legal, ethical and proportionate use uh, of new technologies. It's for this reason um, that I plan to form an independently chaired reference group to scope the possible legal and ethical issues arising from emerging technological developments. The overall aim is to ensure Police Scotland can continue to have both the powers to keep our communities safe, but also, crucially, the right safeguards in place to protect the rights of the individual. I believe that the use of independent expertise has delivered a real improvement for Scottish policing in areas such as uh, stop and search, for example, uh, and biometrics. At present, this is simply a policy intention, so I am unable to go into uh, much detail about the full remit of membership of the group, but of course, very keen to hear thoughts of the subcommittee. Uh, I'm very keen to see Scotland's criminal justice system at the forefront of, new, of using new and developing technologies to fight crime, but I'm clear that this requires absolutely to be balanced uh, with the human rights and ethical considerations. So I'd be very interested in hearing the views of the subcommittee about how this group could move forward, but also, of course, look forward to uh, question and answers uh, specifically about uh, digital triage devices. OK, thank you very much for that opening statement, Cabinet Secretary. Do you, Cabinet Secretary, believe the overarching legal framework uh, requires to be updated? I think people are aware, and of course the committee have on record, that we want uh, the Police Scotland to have the best possible equipment. You talk about legality and proportionality. That obviously has to apply. But do you believe the overarching legal framework needs to be updated? We have also things like facial recognition that are with us. Yeah, I thank the convener for, for the question. Can I reiterate once again the, my thanks to the subcommittee? I think, you know, the, you know, this has been scrutiny that uh, has been welcome. We should never shy away from scrutiny. I think it's shone a light on some important issues and, and, and you know, the legal framework. So, convener, you described uh, or you asked the question about whether I think the overarching was the word you used, the legal framework, uh, is, 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 is adequate. And then you also, in your question, spoke about facial recognition, which is obviously into the biometric sphere. So I suppose it depends on what our definition is of overarching legal framework. The, the purpose of the independently formed group, in my opinion, and, and, and is a policy intention at this stage, and I'll, I'll seek views of members of this committee on how to develop it further, but my policy intent would be that it would bring together uh, the, the likes of human rights advocates, of course, as well as, uh, importantly, uh, no doubt, academics and those with um, particular expertise, looking at almost horizon scanning of what the next technologies to emerge will be in the coming years. Now, that can be difficult, of course, to predict. But whether or not there are issues that we have to consider from an ethical point of view, a human rights point of view, and importantly, related to your question, a legislative and legal framework point of view. Um, in terms of, 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 of overarching legal framework, um, 
you know, on this particular issue of, of, of digital triage devices, otherwise known as, as cyber kiosks, um, obviously Police Scotland are the ones, and SP are the ones that have to satisfy themselves around the, the, the legal advice that they've they've received before proceeding uh, with this, and, 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 and obviously from the evidence they believe they have that legal basis. When it comes to other issues, and you touched upon facial recognition, that is why the biometrics bill which we're bringing forward is going to be hugely important. Uh, and that biometrics bill will, will, will uh, develop, create the role of a biometrics commission in Scotland as well as a code of practice. So I think it's always important that we as a parliament legislate uh, where we can uh, and where it is appropriate to give as much reassurance I think that's important, as much reassurance as possible around some of these ethical considerations so that the public are reassured. Because you know, I've heard the Chief Constable say on many occasions, and he's right to say, that policing in Scotland is by consent and consent of the people. And therefore, I think those safeguards are hugely important. Thank you. You touched on the legality. I have a couple of questions on that before passing to other members, Cabinet Secretary. And <laughs> one of them is about whether you believe there's a, a legal basis to introduce the use of cyber chaos. The, the committee's heard from the Scottish Human Rights Commission, um, both in person and in, in writing, and the, the, these uh, communications are available on the, the committee's website. Also heard from the faculty advocates, advocates in the Scottish Criminal Bar Association that there isn't a legal basis to introduce can you comment on that? Do you believe there is? Well, I, I, I'm going to resist the temptation, t t t temptation in some regard, convener, for, for a couple of reasons. Um, one, uh, of course, I'm not a lawyer, nor a QC, uh, and therefore I rely, uh, as all other government ministers do, on legal advice from, from Lord Advocate or indeed from, from Scottish Government Legal Department. But uh, the member uh, is, is absolutely uh, aware that we do not disclose whether that legal advice has been taken uh, or indeed the nature of that legal advice, which I think is an important principle in a convention. Although I can understand sometimes cause frustration uh, to, 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 to uh, our colleagues in the opposition, uh, no doubt even sometimes maybe our own backbenchers, but it is important that that, that, that remains and retains the case. My job... Um, in, in, in this regard um, is to, uh, I think, as I said, with the independent newly formed group is to, to look at the, the future landscape and see whether there are any legal but also ethical human rights considerations that have to be taken into account. Some of those will be legislative, some of them not. But I must reiterate, it is absolutely for Police Scotland and the SPA to satisfy themselves in any issue, including this one, that they have a legal basis to proceed with it. They've reflected. I think they came to this, back to this committee in a very reflective and, and considered uh, manner, um, reflected on what the committee subcommittee has, has had to say, and they are satisfied that they are operating within that legal framework. You ask me personally, what do I think? I'm, I'm afraid it's the Justice Secretary. I don't comment on my own personal opinions. May well be. I'm a member of the government. Uh, I do not uh, have legal expertise. Uh, I'm not an advocate, not a QC, uh, not, not, not a lawyer, solicitor. Um, and, and as I say, we don't divulge whether we've taken legal advice or indeed the nature of that legal advice is for Police Scotland to satisfy themselves and SPA in this regard. I absolutely understand that long-standing convention. But of course, uh, our job is to, to scrutinise and it's to understand and, uh, about concerns um, because there may be occasions where it quite legitimately the government have concerns if well, no one's going to ask whether you've taken legal opinion on it or... Um, these concerns are often openly expressed. C can I ask then, and maybe try a different attack, in relation to what Police Scotland and the Police Authority rely on um, to provide they understand the reassurance, and that's Mr McLeod's, uh, the QC's, uh, Murder McLeod QC's le legal opinion, and specifically the concerns that have been expressed to us about the restricted remit and information that that covers. Now, absolutely readily accept that a, a, a legal opinion can't cover every conceivable scenario. But um, it did exclude elements that concerns have been raised with the subcommittee about, and again, these are a matter of public record. Can you give any view on the, the reliance that uh, Police Authority and Police Scotland are placing on Mr McLeod's opinion? Uh, convener, I salute your indefatigability. Um, to coin a phrase um, on this, <laughs> and, 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 and pursuing <laughs> no no, par to be no parallels, <laughs> no parallels are drawn to either of you or me in, 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 in coining that phrase. Um, but but I suppose in, in an attempt to, to, to somewhat give further reassurance, perhaps. Um, I noted the, the legal advice that was taken from Murdoch McLeod QC. Now, that, of course, was taken on, on the back of 
uh, concerns raised by uh, the subcommittee, but also those that you took evidence on. Um, it was it was a, a safeguard that Police Scotland wanted to use uh, and to bring forward to further strengthen their legal case around digital triage devices. Um, I don't doubt that there's some um, concerns and, and qualifications that, in fact, I've seen them, that the Scottish Human Rights Commission, uh, and I think ICO uh, had also expressed in relation to that legal advice. I would draw subcommittee's attention to Mr McLeod's opinion, which states, and I quote directly, that my principal conclusion is that there is a lawful basis for the use of, of, of cyber kiosks. Now, the, the convener you know, asks, I think, a very legitimate question on behalf of those organisations that question the remit of that legal advice, the questions that it was, the legal advice was exploring. Ultimately, what I would say is that if there is a difference in, 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 in opinion uh, of, of law, then obviously, and I'm not advocating for this, but obviously if there was a legal challenge, it would be up to the courts to make that determination. Decide. We saw that recently in a more local case and in Glasgow City Council and, and, and the decisions that they took in around rerouting um, marches and parades. And, and, and ultimately there was a difference uh, of opinion about whether that was lawful or legal by those who are taking part in advocating uh, those parades and, and, and the city council and ultimately the courts made determination which I thought was, was helpful. I think these things can sometimes be helpful, costly at times, but can be helpful. So I suppose the only the only thought that reflection that I would offer in that regard would be that um, if, if the police SPA um, are on one side and, and a number of organisations believe that the legal basis um, is, is not there, then, then, then of course it would be open for them to test that at the courts. Clearly, you have an oversight role, um, Cabinet Secretary. Are, are you satisfied that the Scottish Police Authority have taken appropriate legal advice on this matter? Yes, uh, they, they um, obviously have their own internal processes around legal advice, but they've obviously gone here a, a step further, I think, going to Myrtle McLeod um, QC. You're right, I do have an, an, an oversight uh, role. I would say I've, I found it interesting being, being Cabinet Secretary for Justice the last year that Police Scotland, in my opinion, is one of the bodies that has more scrutiny than many other public bodies, for good reason. They also have a lot of power and authority that many other public bodies simply would not have. But, you know, they have two committees that they answer to uh, in this parliament, including this one, obviously. They have the PARC, they have HMICS, they have Audit Scotland, as well as the scrutiny body, which is the Scottish Police Authority, and, of course, my own, as you describe it rightly, the, the oversight role that I have as Cabinet Secretary for Justice. So there's no shortage of lights being shone on to Police Scotland, and I think that's a good thing. It's perhaps fortunate that it was this committee that shone the particular light on the concerns there are about this introduction. Of course. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't disagree with that. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Fulton. <coughs> Thanks, Convener. Uh, good day, afternoon, Cabinet Secretary. Um, the the Convener has actually covered um, a, a lot of the area uh, that, that I was looking at, so I, I'm just going to actually ask um, if you could specifically comment on the evidence from the Scottish Human Rights Commission that the law around the use of cyber chaos lacks sufficient quality to be accessible and foreseeable. And as you, I know that you've already commented this, and the current legal framework does not provide sufficient and robust safeguards for people's privacy rights in this context. So I had a couple of questions around that, but I think, yeah, I think you have answered most of it in, 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 to the conveners. It's just really a specific comment on the SHRC. Yeah, but I'm happy to, to give a kind of caveated response to those concerns. Again, that caveat being the one that I've already mentioned, I'm, I'm not an advocate, QC, solicitor, lawyer, despite my mum's uh, best intentions. So I'm, I'm not any of those. Um, so all, all I can give you is, 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 is the landscape as, as I see it. So uh, I have met with the SHRC uh, recently, and um, actually recently now, it's probably been, been a couple of months uh, since I met Judith Robertson, and um, they've of course raised this and, and, and a couple of other issues. And their explanation to me, and they've reiterated this in the letter to the committee, is, is that phrase uh, to quote, in accordance with law, which is essentially the, the use of the devices requires to be accessible and foreseeable to an individual who may be subject to its use. Um, so if there are guidelines accessible to the public, then this may, be, may well go in, in, in some way to meeting this requirement. But again, that's a matter of contention, no doubt, in terms of law. Um, so Police Scotland, from, from their point of view, I know that they've given reassurances that the devices will be used very much within strict parameters. Uh, when conducting the initial search that takes place in a triage uh, on a triage device, um, and also putting in place digital forensic examination principles, uh, a commitment to how Police Scotland will carry out examinations, and that will be 
accessible to the public. And that's the important point, because the in accordance with law is about accessibility and foreseeability. So um, they, they've said those those principles that very much will be accessible to the public. There's also been the training of 410 police officers on proper use of the triage device. Um, that's now complete and... and um, written guidance to the officers is in the process of being finalised in cooperation with stakeholders that are part of Police Scotland stakeholder and external reference uh, groups. So, you know, that would be Police Scotland's response to, to, to that particular criticism from SHRC around in accordance with law. Whether that satisfies SHRC, they can obviously speak for themselves, I suspect probably not. And it just goes back to my, 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 my point to the convener that, you know, ultimately where there are those disagreements um, and in Police Scotland are very certain that they have a legal basis for 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 these devices then one option that this can be settled obviously is, is within the co-ops but there is a, obviously a genuine disagreement uh, on this matter and I think it's I'm sure sincerely held but it's it's a genuine disagreement Happy with that. thank you for that. Stuart. Uh, thank you very much and I think uh, the the cabinet secretary's uh, comments lead us into uh, the, the whole issue of a statutory code of practice is one way uh, of uh, uh, creating a publicly visible framework for digital f forensic principles and other parts. And I, w I wonder, uh, Cabinet Secretary, whether if uh, we were to have a statutory code of practice, it might include uh, the principles more generally, because it seems to me there are two principles involved here, that uh, the kind of... Um, triaging we're talking about here has the benefit to both suspects and third party uh, witnesses in returning their equipment to them sooner than the current systems might provide and it might be useful to include that but more fundamentally the overriding principle is that it enhances the uh, investigatory powers of the police to, to gather proper evidence in relation to uh, a suspected or reported crime uh, so, does the, the Cabinet Secretary think that having a statutory code of practice for not simply uh, these devices, but more generally for uh, the seizure and examination of IC devices, and indeed taking that a little further, the examination of data that may be stored beyond the device that is physically held by someone uh, in what is now generically called the cloud? Uh, can I thank my very learned friend on, for that question because he's often uh, one that is well ad, ad, uh, advancing uh, in advance of many other members in this parliament including myself when it comes to technology uh, so I know he's got a great uh, interest in these matters and a great uh, knowledge of these matters uh, as, as, as well let me try to give him some reassurances as, as best I can uh, which is the new independently chaired group that I'm uh, advocating would look at the, again, horizon scanning, the future technologies that may well be coming our way, and they will very much look at whether or not there is a need for potentially legislation, potentially statutory guidance, codes of practice, uh, and so on and so forth. So they will explore, I think, those very issues. That's my intent, as of course I listen to, to, to feedback from, from others, but that would be the intent that they would very much look at that. In terms of where we are currently, um, it is, you know, the, 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 the work we've done to get to the biometrics bill, you know, which was that kind of independent advisory group looking into the issue, um, you know, examining, exploring, and then suggesting that the next steps would be a biometrics commissioner, or a bill, a biometrics commissioner, uh, and, and, and a code of practice, uh, is exactly why I want this group uh, to be set up to look at other technologies. So in terms of biometrics, um, the, the purpose of the bill which we've introduced is to create the office of the commissioner, but also very much for that commissioner to develop a code of practice. Now, um, how that what that code of practice looks like, um, what that code of practice uh, involves, will be up to, of course, the independent commissioner. What I would say is that, although I've put a focus on future-proofing future technologies, it would be absolutely up to the Commissioner to look at current technologies, including digital triage devices or anything else, to say, in his or her opinion, that actually there needs to be an additional safeguard of some sort, be it codes of practice, 
be it statutory guidance, be it even legislative. Um, but at the moment, as I say, Police Scotland are satisfied that legal framework they have at the moment, a legal basis for for for, for digital triage devices is is um, is sound. Let me ask for a fairly brief comment on this. Um, EHRC is a set of principles and in considerable detail that's endured decades. Are we anywhere near being able to lay down some principles uh, that will endure beyond our ability to see to the current horizon and, and set a more general, higher level principles that are sufficiently simply expressed that they will be accessible to at least an engaged proportion of the lay public? I think it's a great question. Uh, one that I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to answer, I think, particularly well, and that um, you know, just the pace of technology uh, is fascinating. <laughs> Maybe, but if you just let me attempt to, to at least give you some thoughts and reflections, if not a particularly <laughs> particular answer. Um, the, pa the pace of technology uh, is so fast. You know, I think about my own mobile phone. Uh, and members will be able to, to, to appreciate this too. I own my own mobile phone. The previous model that I had to this mobile phone uh, it didn't uh, allow me to have fingerprint technology, didn't have iris recognition, didn't have facial recognition. Uh, and that's not an advert for, for the mobile phone app. That's true of whatever brand of mobile phone uh, that, that, that you have. So what will the next models and the next models after that? I mean, it is truly mind-boggling when you start to look into this. And I do take, take an interest in, in, in technology and how that might advance. That are we able to put in place a code of practice, any, any sort of principle, sorry, uh, that, 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 that will be able to capture uh, the issues that that, that, that that technology may well bring? Well, the independent group that I'm now hoping to form, and I'll take views again of the subcommittee on, on, on that, will attempt as best as it possibly can to horizon scan and, and put together those principles, be they guidance, codes of practice, or legislative vehicles. So that's an attempt to answer your question. I'm happy for, of course, my officials to come in if they have anything particular to, to add to it. Yeah, they agree? Oh, wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> OK, uh, thank you, Cameron Secretary. Um, Rona, you have some yes, questions? Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you, Convener. Um, yes, if I could maybe just follow up on that and ask a wee bit more about the independently chaired reference group. Um, can you say when it will be established? Are you able to...? Yeah, at the moment, it is genuinely a policy attempt, but I wouldn't want it to wait too long uh, at all. I think these things should move at a, at a, at a good pace. Um, you know, I, 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 I'm really keen to hear views. I appreciate I've only just told the subcommittee about it, but I'd be very keen to hear both the subcommittee and the general justice committee's views on uh, potentials for membership and, and remit. But there should not be a, you know, this is not a, a lengthy process to get this group uh, mm -hmm. up and running. And with, with regard to remit, um, are you, do you envisage or include consideration of the use of digital device triage systems prior to their introduction or retrospectively to scrutinise them? Yeah, I mean, it's not been created to look at specifically at digital triage uh, devices because, as I say, Police Scotland SPA believe they have that kind of legal basis. It doesn't preclude them from looking at that. The independent group should have, you know, because of its independence, its wider berth to look at whatever technologies uh, you kind of past, present, future... Uh, that it wishes to do so, but it is um, it is more than just digital triage devices looking at, as I say, more so in terms of the, the, the pace of technological change, what do we envisage will come our way in the next five plus years, and are we sufficiently ensuring we have the ethical and human rights protections to go side that go go go, go to this, uh, alongside that technolo te te technology. Yeah, and it's, so it will be working with the proposed biometrics commissioner yeah. as part of, as part of that. And um, maybe you can't say at this stage you're envisaging it'll, it will meet in public and it will be um, there'll be public membership on it, or is it going to be is it going to be transparent? Is really what I'm trying to yeah, say. Yeah, again, I'll, I'll take views very much so, but I mean it should be as, as open, transparent, particularly on this issue that it's mm -hmm. considering. I mean, it'd be, there may be issues of, of particular sensitivity if they take advice or evidence from, mm -hmm. you know. Um, you know, particular intelligence services or so on and so forth but I would imagine that for 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 the most part uh, as opposed uh, it should be the rule that um, these things should be open transparent uh, and public and in terms of membership uh, as well I'd be keen that um, you know those human rights organizations uh, that have an interest in this if they are not members and we'll obviously give that consideration of course then then, then they should be able to interact with that mm -hmm. uh, body uh, that group sorry in a very open 
and uh, in, in public way. Yeah, and Police Scotland presumably would be involved in it as well. If not members, they would certainly be liaising with it. Sure, I would, yeah. I would, I would suspect so. Again, whether the members are, are better liaising, um, again, let, let's give that some some thought about um, what is the correct and most appropriate. But it really is important that the the ethical and um, human rights considerations are central to, to, to this group. And, and therefore, the independent chair of that group will also be very, very important as well. So we have mm -hmm. to give that some, and we are giving that some, some very detailed thought. OK, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Daniel. <coughs> thank you, convener. Back on the 13th of September last year, when we were taking evidence on this topic, we heard that there were severe doubts about the legal basis and severe doubts about uh, the human rights compatibility of the introduction of these devices. Uh, and that was at a point in time where the police were actively planning on ruling that, that these devices out within weeks. And when I put it to Chief Superintendent McLean that devising training and planning to rule that when there wasn't that clarity, and he acknowledged there wasn't that clarity, he responded to me saying that was extremely ambitious. Now, I was just wondering what the Cabinet Secretary's reflections are on that, because in my view there is both a particular issue around whether there is the legal basis and the human rights basis, but that actually there's also the, the general point around the process and procedures that the police have in place themselves to check and qualify whether or not, whether it's technologies or indeed uh, you know, other uh, operating procedures or other equipment, whether or not there are questions regarding the legality or indeed human rights. Is the Cabinet Secretary satisfied that they, they have those checks and balances in place now? And, 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 and what's his reflection on what, what, what this situation says about the checks and balances they had in place at that time? Well, I think that Daniel draws with the question. It's, 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 it's an absolutely legitimate question uh, to raise, and a legitimate concern to, 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 to raise. When I listen to the evidence um, from uh, Police Scotland and, and, and the SPA on this when they, when they last came to the subcommittee, I thought that their tone was right and that I thought they were very reflective. And I think this is a, this is a no small part, in fact a big part, to do with <laughs> the work that all of you uh, in the subcommittee have done, um, shone that light on that process. Now we have to remember Police Scotland is on a journey, of course, we're, we're well into that journey uh, now. But I think if the question is, were there lessons to learn from the rollout of digital triage devices? Yes, for sure. Um, am I confident that those lessons have been learned for future technological uh, advances that may well come out? Yes, I'm confident, particularly with the processes that are in place in terms of various panels. Um, but actually, to be honest, just living through some of these experiences, uh, I think, I would hope, and I do believe, would give Police Scotland um, a lot of food for thought when it comes to um, future uh, th th these issues in, in the future. I think as a parliament, we, and as a government, I would hope, we've demonstrated that when it comes to issues that have these considerations, they're not always technological and basis. Stop and search would be an example. When issues are raised, that taking uh, an approach that invites experts, that is independently chaired, uh, that is done in a very open, to go back to Rona Mackay's question, a very open manner and conducted in a very open investigation in an open manner, then we will always benefit from that as opposed to be any worse off for it. Um, so I can't promise you that there will not be issues uh, in the future that uh, the subcommittee will, 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 will question the human rights basis of or legal basis of. Of course, uh, that would be operational for Police Scotland to, to give that con um, um, confidence and, and, and reassurance. But I do believe they have the processes in place to hopefully be able to, to give those assurances. Uh, well, on that last point, uh, I would say to the, the Cabinet Secretary, there's only one thing that would worry me more about us... Uh, than finding issues, which is not finding them, because indeed there are always going to be issues they do need to be found. But that being said, I'm just wondering on what basis the Cabinet Secretary has confidence that those checks and balances are, are now in place, because when we took evidence from uh, Wilco and Police Scotland, there was very heavy reliance on the introduction of a uh, new ethics committee, but my understanding was that that had not been instituted as yet. So can I just ask the Cabinet Secretary, what, what communication has he had with Police Scotland? What assurance has he had? And, and indeed, what structures is the 
Cabinet Secretary relying on that now exists within Police Scotland, which would ensure that these checks and balances are regarding the legality, ethics and human <coughs> rights for equipment and operating procedures is now in place? Yeah, well, well, I mean, I've had conversations directly with the Chief Constable on, on the issue of digital triage uh, devices and, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure he wouldn't mind me, me saying uh, that, uh, you know, I, I found him to be very reflective uh, of, of, of the process. Um, he did give me assurances around the panels that um, the member uh, mentions uh, as well. The, the digital forensic examination principles which have been put in place and now officers are trained, 410 of them, uh, in, in terms of how to use these devices. All of that gives me confidence that they've learnt those lessons uh, and put in place uh, the processes. That doesn't stop me from saying, and I do caveat, and this is an important caveat, that um, you know, there may well be issues that this subcommittee, through its exploration, investigation and examination, picks out that, 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 that they still believe um, Police Scotland need to go further. Now, hopefully the independent group that I'm uh, advocating uh, will be able to assist Police Scotland in looking down the road at what technol technology and technological advances there will be, as hard as they are to predict and ensure that Police Scotland are not caught uh, and, uh, out, out with any potential issues around legality or human rights or, 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 or ethics. Um, the first part of his question, or maybe his comment, was, was um, you know, your concern is, is, is will we find it? Uh, will we find these issues? And I'll just go back to what I said to the, to the convener, uh, which I think is a good thing. There is, I don't think, a public body that is under as much scrutiny as Police Scotland is, rightly so. But SPA, you know, HMIC, yes, uh, SPA, uh, uh, it's a subcommittee, sorry, Justice Sub, uh, Policing Subcommittee, the Justice Committee, Audit Scotland, um, you know, and, and, and of course, um, oversight role uh, by, by the government as well. So there is a lot of scrutiny on Police Scotland, um, and, and so I wouldn't have too many concerns, if I can say respectfully to the member, that um, if there are issues that they won't uh, be found and, and, and no doubt flushed out and, and, and discussed in a very frank uh, manner. So, of course, Cabinet Secretary, the, the, the issues that have been identified aren't just related to legalities or human rights. There are also, I think, substantial questions raised in the evidence that we received last time from the police regarding the way that the money was spent. I and mean, in particular, two issues have arisen from that. One is the that the fact that this spend seemed to be just below the threshold that would have required explicit approval from the SPA board. But actually, more critically, in terms of the evidence we received last time, was the fact that when the police uh, uh, made the decision to spend this money, they didn't take into account the ongoing uh, costs of this equipment. They simply looked at the upfront costs. Now, that seems to me an extraordinary thing for an organisation of any size, but let alone a, a, an organisation with the importance and size of Police Scotland, that when they're looking at a business case, that they don't look at the totality of the life cycle costs of any equipment that they're purchasing. Does that not raise serious questions regarding their own internal uh, you know, spending procedures? And, and has the Cabinet Secretary asked it, uh, any questions regarding that? Because ultimately, it is the Cabinet Secretary's responsibility in terms of how taxpayers' money is spent within the Justice Sector in Scotland. <coughs> Yes, and, and look, I have confidence in uh, both Police Scotland but also SPA's um, financial uh, scrutiny uh, of these matters and of the financial scrutiny. Uh, more gen generally, I've uh, met with uh, their, their financial officers on many occasions to discuss many a project, but that doesn't mean that the government won't question often um, some of the, the rationale for particular spending. An example of that, which we've aired very publicly, in fact, might have been the topic of discussion the last time I was here, potentially, if I remember correctly, was, was the DDICT uh, investment that the government is asked, being asked to, to make. And, and um, you know, because of issues like I-6, we can't ignore those issues, uh, the issues the members raised as well. Uh, as a government, yes, I will always uh, do this, and I will make no apologies for continuing to get as many assurances as possible on the spending um, uh, in the business cases, I should say, for, 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 for various projects. In the same breath, it's important for me to say, and I think Daniel Johnson will understand this, as a Cabinet Secretary for Justice, you know, I cannot spend my time micromanaging the budget of, of Police Scotland. I don't think there's an expectation that I would do that. But it is important that um, I and we give SPA their due place 
when it comes to scrutinising um, that 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 spend, um, uh, uh, and of course, as I say, I have confidence in the people uh, that are both in Police Scotland and SPA to be able to to manage that that, that appropriately. Uh, on that note, I would just say I think there's a bit of a difference between uh, scrutinising individual items of spend and overall process. But I, I, I would just like to move on to to one final point. I, mean, I think it's a mistake in this area to look at this technology and uh, simply think that this would be used in terms of taking evidence from people who may be suspects or in, a, in a particular crime. It will also be the case that, that, that people who are complainants or witnesses will also be asked to surrender their device and may even be doing so subject to warrant. Now, the, the Council's uh, 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 advice on this is actually relatively brief, and indeed, the Open Rights Group um, have highlighted uh, that very fact. Um, you know, given the issues that, that have arisen south of the border uh, in, in recent months in terms of the, the, the way that the police have been asking people to surrender their devices, in particular uh, victims of, of sex, sex crimes, is the Cabinet Secretary satisfied that there is a, a legal basis for using the, uh, the, this equipment in this way with regard to witnesses and, and victims? And, 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 and if not, how can that be resolved? Yeah, I, I am confident because of what I've heard from Police Scotland uh, on this, and particularly on the back of, of um, uh, some of the reports we heard from, from down south in the CPS. So I, I, I am confident. Um, I've often shared a, a stage and a platform with the Chief Constable in the last year, and almost on every single one of those platforms, he has made the point that policing is by consent and not by consent of this parliament or of any cabinet secretary, but consent of the people. And, uh, you know, I've been given a, a number of reassurances that when it comes to the digital triage, that, um, of course, uh, particularly um, when it comes to witnesses and complainers, that they would uh, uh, want to do that uh, in, in, in a way that is uh, with, with, with the individual's consent uh, and they're developing the appropriate form uh, to capture that consent. Um, now, there may be times when, uh, you know, the, the, the police would have to seize a device either through warrant, as, as you mentioned, or, you know, if there are issues around protection, the obligation to protect life, or indeed terrorism-related issues, that, um, that they, they, they would have to, 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 to bypass that consent. But that would be the exception. Um, absolutely uh, not the rule. So it would be by consent. Um, you know, I try to think about this from also a personal point of view, uh, in that I have been a victim of, of, of a number of online uh, crimes, mainly kind of racial and Islamophobic um, uh, abuse that's come my way and subsequently reported it to the police. In fact, there's a, a case coming up very shortly, I think, on, in this regard. And so, uh, and, and me being able to hand over my device at that time, uh, you know, if I think about one case that I was involved in, 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 in shortly after the Paris attacks, um, you know, at that, at that point, um, it was really important for me to get the reassurances even back then that I got from Police Scotland. Now, I wasn't Cabinet Secretary for Justice at the time, but to get those reassurances from police that, you know, this is what we will do with your device, this is how it will be used, um, you will get it back as soon as we possibly can, and it was... You know, that day, luckily for me. Um, so I, I think things have moved on since then quite quite a lot. But throughout all of that, the, the issue of consent is absolutely pivotal and vital, particularly when it comes to complainers and when it comes to victims of crime. But equally, uh, of course, even those that are being complained about, um, the police will aim to take their advices with consent. Now, it's important that that's, that, that, that is on the record. But if they can't, then they have the options of judicial warrant and so on and so forth. Thank you. Liam? Yeah, thank you. I, I start by apologising. I was slightly late into the to the committee. Um, I, yeah. You talked earlier, Cabinet Secretary, about um, I think what you described as an honest um, difference of opinion, which still appears to be there. I mean, is it a concern to you that, that uh, notwithstanding what you said earlier, 
that there does appear to be a lack of confidence uh, in the approach being taken by um, Police Scotland and the legal basis uh, underpinning that approach with key stakeholders like um, the Scottish Human Rights Commission, like the Information Commissioner, um, Faculty of Advocates as well, I think, have, have also expressed their concerns. Is that, is that a concern to you? I mean, I know, as, is, as you said before, um, you see it as an, an honest um, disagreement, but it, it's fairly fundamentally important, is, is it not? It is fundamentally important, of course, and it's, it's why I'm in front of the subcommittee, uh, rightly being 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 uh, interrogated, or uh, well, that's maybe a harsh word, but uh, being 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 questioned uh, about this issue. It's, it's right that I am, uh, of course. So it is an issue of, of of absolute fundamental importance. I agree with Lee MacArthur um, on 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 that. I have an immense amount of time for for organisations like Scottish Human Rights uh, Council uh, for. Uh, ICO, of course, uh, and, and, and many of the others that have raised concerns that Liam MacArthur mentions. So I would certainly never be dismissive of those concerns, and I hope I never give that impression. I just simply think that what we've got, where we've got to now, is initial concerns being raised very legitimately. Um, Police Scotland pausing what they're doing, reflecting on those concerns, taking further advice legal advice on those concerns, satisfying themselves of those concerns. And um, at the same point, we still have particular, quite niche, but again, legitimate concerns still coming from the likes of the Scottish Human Rights Commission. Um, and when I say legitimate, I mean, you know, again, I caveat all this, I'm not, not, not legally trained, but, you know, I don't doubt very honest concerns that they have and to be honest the only way I can really see it being resolved if, if, if they wish to do that is, is potentially you know the, the option that's open to them is, is, is going to the courts I'm not advocating again for that um, but it is an option that is open to them I mean, you, you point to that and, and I suppose that would give rise to very serious concerns I mean it would it would represent a, a fairly fundamental breakdown in that uh, in that relationship. I think as we observed as a subcommittee, um, the way in which Police Scotland have engaged with those stakeholders has, I think, improved markedly over that, that period and we're in a better place as a result. But I think convincing the Scottish Human Rights Commission, um, the Information Commission or even the, the, the faculty of the value of continuing to engage in that process if the concerns that they are raising at this stage um, are acknowledged but then set aside um, by, by Police Scotland and in, 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 uh, in proceeding with the rollout. Is that, is that a realistic concern, do you think? I, I'm not sure I would quite characterise it the way that, that Liam MacArthur does. I mean, I, I think it would be uh, unfair to suggest that, the, you know, from the moment that Police Scotland paused the rollout of the digital triage devices, further reflected on... Um, SHRC's concerns uh, and, and many other stakeholders' concerns, as well as the subcommittee's concerns, took advice. I don't think they, they, they swept aside the concerns by any stretch of imagination. What they haven't been able to do, perhaps, from the correspondence I've seen from SHRC and ICO, uh, is fully satisfy them uh, in terms of the concerns that they had. Um, but I would say that I, uh, my, my genuine belief is, and I, and I do think subcommittee members uh, would, would hopefully agree that the police have then attempted to engage with the likes of SHRC and others uh, in, in a very open uh, manner and way. The independently chaired reference group that I'm uh, I've just uh, mentioned and, and and written to committee about, um, I think the likes of the SHRC, if they're willing, would be a very very important voice in that. So that when it comes to again the future. Uh, advancements in technology then we're in a place where we can gain their concerns absolutely from the beginning uh, and do our best to satisfy them there may well come a point where despite that they are still not satisfied there again is a very honest legal uh, difference of opinion and it's often mentioned in, in, in joking and passing and maybe I shouldn't say this is cabinet secretary for justice but you get two lawyers in the room you might well get five opinions now you know there, there can be many opinions on matters of law uh, and legality so I think you know as I say that there are options 
open to be able to resolve that. I don't, I don't think I would quite characterise it as, as, a, as, a, as a total breakdown of trust. I do agree it's, a, it's quite a, a step to take um, to, to take these matters to the court. But ultimately, you know, that could be a place to, to, to resolve uh, these differences if you can't do it through dialogue, through changing procedures, through improving, um, uh, improving processes uh, and so on and so forth. But it is an option that's open. I just conclude with that. I mean, I'm not entirely sure the basis on which you would make this assessment, but but what, in your opinion, is the the public view of the rollout of of, um, of these devices? I mean, it, 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 is there public confidence? Do you think, um, given the concerns that have been raised around data protection and, and, and human rights, do you reckon that's um, that, that's going no. to have slightly undermined public confidence? Uh, you know, in, in some respects, uh, of course. Uh, and Carthus right, it's, it's sometimes difficult to, to judge these and make an assessment of where absolute public opinion is. All of us will claim to always represent public opinion from the job that we do and we'll always have vastly different opinions uh, on this. Um, I think it's incumbent upon Police Scotland and the SPA to do their utmost when it comes to issues that infringe on, uh, uh, potentially infringe on individuals, uh, ethical considerations, human rights considerations, anything else, that the onus has to be on the bodies like Police Scotland to give as much confidence as possible to the public. And I think that's why they've gone out to get a further QC opinion to s and, and, and why their um, uh, principles, so examination uh, principles will be will be accessible and, and, and open to try to give that public reassurance. We know that from data that more and more crimes are committed in the digital space, um, often involving you know very young adolescents and, 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 and children, um, and so we know that, or we can forecast that this issue is only going to become more important. Uh, and, and the investigation of crime and not less important. And I think uh, we had a very interesting uh, presentation from SCJR yesterday, uh, Victims Task Force, about uh, the views of rape victims and their journey throughout the justice process. And one of the comments from one of the victims was that months had gone by and she still did not have her device back with her. She said, she made a comment along the lines of, and I'm paraphrasing, but, you know, I don't know where my pictures have gone, who's viewed them, and so on and so forth. So I thought that was quite hard-hitting. And therefore, I think we absolutely have to, and when I say we, certainly Police Scotland here and SPA, on this issue, uh, which involves such important ethical considerations, have to ensure that they're giving the absolute maximum public reassurance. And if that means having, as they've done in this case, pausing things, reflecting further, um, improving processes, guidance, training, whatever else, then that's what they should do. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Daniel with a supplementary and then Stuart, and I'm conscious of time because yeah. members, so, members so have to be in chamber. So I'm struck by the fact that neither Liam no McArthur nor you are able to point to a place that would demonstrate public support for this or not. And indeed, I mean, I'm heartened by the fact that you, you know, are highlighted the importance of policing by consent. Indeed, Susan Deacon did exactly the same thing when she was before us. But is it not the case we have a structure where you appoint the chair of the SPA and the SPA appoint the chief constable and nowhere in that loop of accountability is there the public voice? Is there a need now to look at how consent, not just on an individual basis, but collectively, is sought and established? And indeed, is there a role here for some form of deliberative democracy so that we can actually understand whether or not the public really do consent to equipment and procedures such as these being used in terms of the way that they're policed by Police Scotland? I think we should always give careful consideration to any proposals that enhance the public voice, uh, potentially in excuse me, appointments. What I would say in the appointment of the chair, when you say I appointed the chair, of course, ultimately the decision, well, my process, but ultimately the decision would be for the cabinet secretary. But my understanding uh, was that the former convener of the subcommittee also played a role, he was Mary Fee, played a role in the appointment of the chair and was on the appointment panel. So therefore, you know, um, in terms of capturing that public voice, um, you could could make the argument that uh, potentially the convener of, of the subcommittee on policing 
uh, represents that public voice, uh, as you often will hear those public concerns uh, at this committee. Um, but if there are if there are further proposals that we should explore, then um, you know they, they should be presented to us. Um, we just have to be careful of potentially unintended consequences. In terms of the first part of this question, um, although I, I'm not able to to, to give you uh, an exact um, assessment of what the public thinks on digital triage devices, um, I can refer, obviously, to the, the Scottish Crime and Justice uh, Survey. I know something that members here will read uh, when it comes out. Uh, and, and, and that found that the majority of adults um, said that the police were doing a good or excellent job in their local area. So, um, you know, again, we're, we're never complacent about that matter and, 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 and no doubt uh, we always have to improve the percentage um, but I think um, there is a lot of confidence in the police and how they do their job. Thank you. Uh, Stuart. Um, arguably a bit of the future has just landed at Police Scotland and will shortly be taken to the air uh, to gather data from which uh, information will be extracted to provide evidence. Uh, I speak, of course, of the drones that have been uh, purchased. Uh, we understand that uh, they were purchased prior to human rights and data protection assessments being carried out. Is the uh, Cabinet Secretary satisfied with the process surrounding the introduction of this particular uh, new piece of equipment? Uh, because it kind of sounds like a bit of a repeat of the issue around uh, the, the, the triage devices that have been the subject of our discussion up till now today. Yeah, um, I think there's been a fair bit of learning um, uh, in relation to, to, to the rollout uh, of, of the drones. Um, if you want, I'm, I'm more than happy to ask Police Scotland to, to write to the member uh, to give them those uh, assurances. Um, can I, can I just in Cabinet Secretary, I, I think if you write to the committee rather than the member is the first point I would say. But equally, you know, let me just be quite robust. I did ask you if you were satisfied. I do want to hear from Police Scotland on the subject. I'm sure committee members will wish to. But it's really about the line of accountability to your office that I'm inquiring about. Uh, yes, uh, and forgive me, that's uh, obviously a fair question to ask. Um, in terms of um, the, the rollouts of, of, of the drones and the technology, um, I'm aware that Police Scotland carried out uh, both full data protection assessments uh, and the quality and human rights impact assessments uh, ahead of the launch. Um, my understanding is actually from uh, the, the, the subcommittee has, has asked for those particular documents. Um, in terms of the privacy aspects of the new drones, um, Police Scotland have informed, I know the SPA, that given their mobility and potential deployment across many communities, uh, the approach being taken to community assessment will very much be uh, at a local level, and I think that's absolutely right uh, that, it, that it's done so. So, uh, yes, I'm, um, I'm, I'm satisfied, I have to say, uh, in relation to, to uh, the issues that using that drone technology uh, could could raise, but I know that uh, the subcommittee has requested additional information. <coughs> excuse me, from Police Scotland, and uh, of course I await their response to receiving that information. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. But we've come to the end of our session. The, the, thank you very much indeed for uh, your time. The, the subcommittee will maintain an interest in the reference group and hope you'll keep us updated on developments with that and indeed may provide some feedback to you as you requested on membership. So can I thank you and your officials for your contribution? And I now close the meeting. <laughs>